So, animal studies. I'll begin with three words. Community, communion, and creatures. So let's turn our attention to the creatures that grace our presence, whether it's the uh, squirrels and the orange cat in the courtyard outside, or the chicken that some of us have been eating this weekend. As we think about creatures and community, two names have echoed in our talks this weekend. I've been hearing the mention of one in particular, Thomas Berry, uh, brought up time and time again, an inspiring person. And in this session on animal studies, I think it's worth remembering his words, as, as he told us that the universe is a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects. We should repeat that often. And another name that gets brought up quite a bit uh, this weekend in particular is Lynn White, right? This is another person who maybe uh, some of us might not think of him in this way, but he also reminds us to think of community and to think of presence of creatures. So in his words, he tells us to remember that we are part of a spiritual democracy of all God's creatures. But yet, these two names, which have been echoed time and time again, pale in comparison to the great work done here by Paul <laughs> and Laura, the, uh, the sort of shining duo of animal studies and animal ethics in, in our fields of study here with animals and religion. And both Paul and Laura have been our guiding voices as we've thought about animals these many years, as we've celebrated for 20 years with them. So let us begin following the program with Paul Waldau. So Paul has been teaching courses on animal law, animal ethics, uh, veterinary ethics, public policy. He uh, directs a Master of Science program in anthrozoology. If there's a course on animals, he's taught it. <laughs> right? And he's written five books. Animal Studies, an introduction is the most recent. Animal Rights, one we all know well, a communion of subjects, animals in religion, science, and ethics. Uh, an Elephant in the Room, the Science and Well-Being of Elephants in Captivity, and The Specter of Speciesism, Buddhist and Christian Views of Animals. Paul, please join us, and let's hear from you. Are we still of any use? Um, before I suggest that we have to respond to that question with a resounding yes, a few thank yous. John, Mary Evelyn, Mary Evelyn. <laughs> no words could capture that. Um, my Frank, your team, thank you so much. Also, Judith and Victoria are here. Whenever you tour in the room, it's like being at home. Thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate the chance to speak with them here. Okay. Uh, let me turn to some matters of hope and hopelessness that came up yesterday. For those who have been journeying across the species line regularly, perhaps you, it came to mind for you the line of the mysterious line of Emily Dickinson that hope is a thing with feathers. Uh, <laughs> it's particularly appropriate at this time given that our establishment um, uh, education and sciences uh, um, now can learn amazing things about non-human animals. Just this year, four books published, I'll give you their titles briefly, Jennifer Ackerman's The Genius of Birds, unbelievable cognitive work on birds. Um, Bernd Heinrichs, One Wild Bird at a Time, Portraits of Individual Lives. We've actually moved to the level beyond species of looking at individuals. Jonathan Baucom's What a Fish Knows, The Inner Lives of Our Underwater Cousins, and Franz de Waal's are we smart enough to know how smart animals are? Um, <laughs> that's one reason to hope such things. Another, I think, is um, in the direction of know thyself, so significant in the Western tradition. Um, most, if not all of us, have been trained to talk about humans and animals. And here's a reason for hope. We can choose to change this dualism, which, like other familiar dualisms, works great harms. I stand before you a mammal, a primate, these are animal categories, 
And I will argue that this dualism and the other dualisms harm greatly our understanding of humans' extraordinary capacities to care. There's a third reason for hope. It's described in my short, flawed <laughs> paper about certain dynamics evident in education today. Most, but perhaps not all of us, um, have had a kind of formal education during the 20th century in domains often referred to uh, in major circles of Western cultural tradition as higher education. Um, but that education was accomplished under the ideas and rhetoric of human exceptionalism. Uh, the dualism is merely an ideology for as so many at the conference have foregrounded. There are tremendous human on human harms. Um, the results of human exceptionalism as an ideology in the world are dire for the more than human world. Many educators and their students have been trained to forget or deny that humans are fine examples of animals. And this situation has prevailed for so long now that talking of humans as animals is now not only unpopular but even politically incorrect. And this is why I ask, are we still of any use? Here is the fuller context of this, a fabulous quote at a very sad time in history, 1943, Dietrich Bonhoeffer writing about his 10 years of experience under the Nazis. He had this fabulous language. We have been silent witnesses of evil deeds. We have been drenched by many storms. We have learnt the arts of equivocation and pretense. Experience has made us suspicious of others and kept us from being truthful and open. Intolerable conflicts have worn us down and even made us cynical, are we? still of any use. To understand why I use Bonhoeffer's lament to herald good news, um, in my paper I try to introduce you to the developing form of contemporary education known as animal studies. But in this oral presentation I can only sketch in very outline fashion um, this kind of introduction. And with these I hope to show you that the field of animal studies has emerged and is growing. Our human po politics, our public policy, our legal systems, our educational establishments, and a lamentable number of our mainline religious institutions have in the last centuries diminished our understanding of humans' capacious ethical abilities to care about a wide range of others. We have been taught an unrelenting, ignorance-driven form of human exceptionalism in and by such establishment interests in our modern industrialized circles. In this paper, I won't go into this in detail, I re refer to our predicament um, using the image from John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, the slew of despond, um, in which the protagonist sinks under his own weight because of his sins. One result of the prevalence of human exceptionalism in such influential circles has been that many human discussions about our own species, ethical abilities to care about a wide range of others, has become truncated. These abilities to care do, however, remain extremely evident in an impressive number of circles for many human cultures, and certainly plenty of individuals have long attested in a variety of ways that humans' ability to care about others is remarkably robust. So for those with a constricted understanding of ethics, along the lines of what prevails today in many um, ethics classes, um, we need to forcefully challenge what's going on and reclaim the capacious nature of our ethics. And that's why I use the Bonhoeffer quote, we have been silent witnesses to evil deeds, we have been drenched by many storms. Now, with regard to taking notice, to noticing and taking seriously oppression, um, the narrative most of us have learned is focused on human suffering, um, um, because human, human oppression is such a serious pro problem, Bonhoeffer's passage is directed solely to that, although the language here allows me to, uh, in the spirit of Chimamanda Adichie, to talk about the dangers of a single story. Um, uh, such dangers call on us to be, again, in Bonhoeffer's hopeful phrasing at the end of the passage, plain, honest, straightforward citizens. In this spirit, I challenge the prevalence prevalence of the one-dimensional narrative that has indeed led many in the human community to be silent witnesses of many evil deeds that do not involve human suffering. The acts I speak of involve, and this goes to the muse for so many of us, Thomas Berry's idea of our larger community. Now, I acknowledge that foregrounding 
problems beyond the species line during times of severe human-on-human -human oppression is deemed by some to be immoral. Let me invoke two insights that encapsulate why I raise this issue at this time um, of great human-on-human -human oppression. Orwell once observed, in times of universal deceit, telling the truth can be a revolutionary act. And I'll suggest to you that we do need a, a certain kind of revolution. Second, a simple logical point that may get lost unless it is foregrounded, challenging the seriousness of human on non-human harms is not in any way to diminish the need for concern about astonishingly prevalent human on human harms that have long been and remain unconscionably severe. These harms within the species line very definitely need the attention of everyone and you can see commendable attention paid to it during this conference. And in fact, these do comprise a subset of the evil deeds that I address today. I don't, I'm not able to use a PowerPoint here, but there, in the paper there is a, an image that describes the, way, the weight of land animals um, by species, overwhelmingly human, and the picture conveys it so much better than words can. And um, if, if you're interested, I will send that to you, but it is a stark picture of what's happening on land in the order of 90% being human or humans um, kept captive animals for our purposes. Now, the reason I'm focusing on the major institutions of our society uh, is that non-human animals are ubiquitous, but our institutional education and has um, made them disappear. It's a formidable act of social construction. Um, tragically, it continues today in the educational system at the lowest levels through which we, you might say, force march our children the very tough problem, they are so natively gifted at noticing other animals and yet we relentlessly pull them away from them as if that is what it means to be a sophisticated adult. So elsewhere I've suggested that if we don't solve this extraordinary battery of human on non-human problems, we have zero prospects of solving the human on human problems. These are linked in extraordinary ways and if one is to be frank and forthright about how we go forward, it's important for us to be ingenuous in the original sense of that word native and inborn, frank um, about how it is that we have trained people to see problems. We have indeed learned the arts of equivocation and pretense. Now you don't need a litany of human on human harms and frankly I'm not going to give you a litany of human on non-human harms although I think it would traumatize all of us to do that. Um, but I will use that to set up the claim, the notice, notion of self-inflicted ignorance about human on non-human harms. It's tragic, the levels of frustration and for those of us who have worked so hard for so long. And the religion and ecology people have been so formidable in getting um, the chance for the non-human question to be raised. This is the key event, is the communion of subjects has opened this up dramatically. So thank you so much for that. Um, now, there, will, um, there exist today many evidence-driven um, challenges to those who ignore deep harms, um, agribusinesses harms, for example. And I give some examples in the paper. One is the documentary Cowspiracy in 2014, which talks about major environmental groups' absolute refusal to talk about the um, contribution of agribusiness to climate changing gases. The simply ignoring of it. It's a, it's a shirking of leadership, as I call it there. Now, such challenges require interdisciplinary approaches, and that gets me to animal studies. It's a field that truly is interdisciplinary, and I won't um, regale you with any um, details about it, except there's a list here of the subjects covered, and you'll see how audacious it is. It's not limited to history, cultural studies, education, natural and social sciences of many kinds, political studies, law, philosophy, critical studies, literature, and other arts, comparative religion, ethics, sociology, public policy studies, social psychology, ah, 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 geography, anthropology, archaeology, criminology. And that's a partial list. Uh, the issue here is other animals are ubiquitous. No wonder they show up in all of our disciplines. We're really attentive animals. Um, and the point here is that if we ignore them, we ignore a fundamental feature of our shared um, community. It's that extraordinary mix of concerns that make the, the, the subject challenging, 
Clearly, humans have to be a principal concern in animal studies. We are, after all, animals. But also, it, are, it is our construction of the other animals that is particularly problematic. And so, what well, I'll finish on this note. What has impressed me in animal studies courses is that in the academic world, when you find you have students of talent and who are leaning into the course and taking it further than you ever imagined you could take it, you, you are sitting on a gold mine in an educational sense. And that dynamic is the single most encouraging thing to me. The only peril I know, I know is you and John enabling scholars around the world with this unbelievably supportive environment that we've come into and so that I can speak this frankly on a topic which is marginalized in society, in education, et cetera. And it has been not only welcomed, but it has been integrated. And that, that is a resounding reason to say, yes, are we still of any use? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Our next speaker is Laura Hobgood. She is Professor of Religion and Environmental Studies at Southwestern University. And she has written some of the most marvelous books I have ever seen. They, they're displayed prominently in my bookshelves. I, I absolutely love these. A Dog's History of the World, The Friends We Keep, Holy Dogs and Asses, what a fun name to say, <laughs> Encyclopedia of Religion and Nature, which she's an executive editor of. And Laura focuses on critical animal studies and religion, as well as environmental history. And the field of animals and religion wouldn't be as vibrant as it is today if it were not for Laura. So let's welcome Laura to give her paper. Well, I'm gonna start the same way that um, many others have. Um, thanking Mary Evelyn and John because we have been so welcomed from the animal studies world into uh, religion and ecology for years. Um, it has been wonderful and you've been gracious doing that. Um, I also want to thank Paul. Um, for 20 years we've worked together getting the animals and religion group going at the AAR. Um, it's been a privilege to, to work with you that whole time, so thank you. I was a little late getting here, so apologies, but the dog I'm currently fostering and her six puppies who were born last Sunday are more important than any academic conference any day of the week. And so I was um, home taking care of some new puppies. So now if you indulge me, I want to say something about the deliberately unheard. Sometimes we have thought of ourselves in animal studies as being the voice for the voiceless, but we're not. They have voices. Um, they have voices, and we have to be committed to hearing those voices. I'm going to come back around to that. In her book, When Species Meet, Donna Haraway questions whether humans can ever really grapple with and finally disempower our sense of human exceptionalism. In a chapter that deals with Marxist theories and lively living capital, Haraway asks, what, however, if human labor power turns out to be only part of the story of lively capital? Of all philosophers, Marx understood relational sensuousness, and he thought deeply about the metabolism between human beings and the rest of the world enacted in living labor. So Marx, Haraway says, got that. Marxist theories articulated well that human beings become lively capital, contributing more to the economic system than they receive. Right, so the majority of humans human bodies are capital and put more into than they get out of economic systems. That is a amplified exponentially with anyone who is not human and with everything that is not human. But Haraway goes on to suggest, as is the case in so many of our fields, that humanocentrism trumped, I hate using that word now, but it keeps coming up, trumped <laughs> a wider vision. She continues, as I read him, however, he, Marx, was finally unable to escape from the humanist teleology of labor, the making of man himself. In the end, no companion species, reciprocal inductions, or multi-species epigenetics are in his story. Marx came so close, but was finally unable to do under the goad of human exceptionalism. Marx was unable to hear the deliberately unheard. Marx, not surprising to me, couldn't get over anthropocentrism, even though Haraway was hopeful that he might. And it's not only Marxist thought, to say the least, it's almost every field of study. 
Critical Animal Studies poses that question, among others, to the academy, and in this case, to the study and practice of religion and ecology. Can religion and ecology think of our planetary future without being bound to the joy and privilege of human exceptionalism? It's a joy, right, because it means we can focus only on us. If there is a planetary future for humans, critical animal studies suggest that religion and ecology must do, must get over the human. It must not only tackle the human nature binary that makes all of nature into a resource to be exploited, but it must deliberately and explicitly tackle the human animal binary, something that Paul and I have obviously spoken about a lot over the years, and that many of you do as well. So thank you so much for working so hard to get over that. The human animal binary is not just a subset of the human nature question. It is at the heart of what it means to be the, a human in the world. I think it is the binary that scares us the most. It changes everything. The human is examined and imagined in a different relationship with nature, in religion and ecology, and certainly more so than in any other field. So that has been so important, and it's been what has been present in most religious traditions. But in the end, is the field finally about humans, granted with flora and fauna connected to us and landscapes? Is it about us? Can we truly decenter the human? Sarah just made wonderful connections via the environmental humanities. And the environmental humanities is trying to decenter the human, which is interesting. Humanities is decentering humans. <laughs> Let me offer an example from another area, the growing field that is, examines social and environmental justice. In a workshop about the pedagogy of social justice with faculty at Southwestern University, the undergraduate liberal arts college where I teach, an interesting thing happened. First, I'm thankful to work at an institution that requires all students as part of general education to take one course tagged with a focus on social justice. And with an environmental studies major that requires students to take another course that focuses on environmental justice. And we just next year in our environmental studies major have added a requirement to take an environmental humanities course. Half of which, by the way, are being offered out of the religion program. So. Mm -hmm. At the workshop a couple of weeks ago, as we went around expressing what our specific questions were about teaching justice in the classroom, I asked the 30 or so faculty members present whether they thought concepts of social justice would or should ever extend beyond consideration of the human. Most present nodded with a knowing type of, well, sure. But after that one query for the next two hours, the conversation never extended beyond the human again. So let me get back to the deliberately unheard. One of the things that humans have used to elevate ourselves above all other animals is that we have language. I think most in this room wouldn't necessarily agree with that, but it's used frequently throughout the humanities. Well, maybe they do too. Maybe other animals have language, just not the same one. We humans, and I quote now from a piece on ableism and animals in disability studies. By the way, disability studies and critical animal studies are intersecting in fascinating ways now too, and I'm sure many of you have seen that. Animals consistently voice preferences and ask for freedom. They speak to us every day when they cry out in pain, or try to move away from our prods, electrodes, knives, and stun guns. Animals tell us constantly that they want out of their cages, that they want to be reunited with their families, or that they don't want to walk down the kill chute. Animals express themselves all the time, and many of us know it. If we didn't, factory farms and slaughterhouses would not be designed to constrain any choices an animal might have. We deliberately have to choose not to hear when the lobster bangs on the walls from inside a pot of boiling water or when the hen who has passed her egg-laying prime struggles against the human hands that enclose her legs and neck. We have to choose not to recognize the preference expressed when the fish spasms and gasps for oxygen in her last few minutes alive. I go a little bit into the Anthropocene at this point in my paper, but I think I'm going to skip over some of that. Basically, it's the idea that humans need to learn how to die in the Anthropocene, and that humans as a species need to learn how to die in the Anthropocene as well. So can religion and ecology take other than humans seriously? Should religion and nature do so? Is that oft-framed position which Paul articulated so beautifully already? We have to make right the human relationships before we can think about other animals. That's usually what is, is used. The final card that allows for human exceptionalism. So what I want to suggest again here, as already mentioned briefly above, is that of all of the binaries, male, female, heaven, earth, white, not white, straight, queer, etc. The one that, if it breaks down, we fear the most is the human-animal one. Once it breaks down, literally everything is different. Who we eat, who we wear, 
how we walk. Granted, breaking down any of these binaries changes society in dramatic and, in my estimation, mostly positive ways for social justice related to humans. But humans walk through the world now with a privilege that is unacknowledged day in and day out. Almost all humans do. And that's the thing that we have difficulty getting to. We are running this planet. And with a positive spin on it, we can save this planet. But obviously, the planet would be fine if we were no longer on it. We are the bully in the planetary classroom. The other students would be best served if we exited the scene. We would just go ahead and learn how to die in the Anthropocene. It might be better for the vast majority of those involved in the ongoing life of this planet. In our saving of the planet, are we simply continuing our triumphalist tyranny over it and all of the other species who inhabit it? In other words, do we who study religion and ecology, which I do as well, oftentimes defining new religions, I'm in the middle of it. I'm working on a piece now about cycling as religion, so um, utterly in the midst of the project of redefining religion as a way of humans living differently. So oftentimes defining new religions or at other times digging into the resources of generally acknowledged religions to find ways to support environmental activism in doing so, are we continuing to reinforce and reinstitute human exceptionalism? Our religions, our cultures at their best can save the planet. That can sometimes be our mantra. But doesn't this mantra simply reinforce the noblesse oblige that humans have enjoyed for centuries, indeed for millennia? And the discussions of when the Anthropocene begins just sort of spin out of control at that point. One of the direct implications of this direct attention to the animal and to ourselves as animal, and this is a difficult one for me, but it's one that I think we need to consider, is that certain cultural sensitivities can no longer be abided. In other words, if we take other than human animals seriously, then the torture of some bears in China to use their bile as part of traditional medicine cannot be condoned. If we take other than human animals seriously, then elephants cannot be chained to trees for 20 years in India in order to serve the needs of a temple. If we take other than human animals seriously, then doves representing the Holy Spirit cannot be placed in a plexiglass box and dropped from the top of the cathedral in Orvieto, Italy. If we take animals seriously, then we can no longer house 10,000 turkeys in one facility in the US and kill over 250 million of them each year, mostly to celebrate the US Holy Day of Thanksgiving. And if we take animals seriously, we can no longer sacrifice them in order to increase the human lifespan through horrific scientific experimentation. So what do we do with that reality? As we cling to ourselves as the saviors of the planet and to our religions as possible conduits for this salvation, how do we shift to a mode of learning how to die, how to decenter the human from this project? Can we do this within the study of religion and ecology? Religion and ecology is on the threshold, I think, more than any other area, though, of pushing this in ways that no other fields can. Since, as Sarah pointed out, religion scholars are good at thinking about the other than human, we can be the model for remaking the human as animal and deliberately hearing the voices of the deliberately unheard as well. Thank you. Thank you, Paul and Laura. We have time for Q&A. And as, as you grace us with the wisdom of your questions, I also ask that you be wise in the brevity of your comments. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I see Mark over here with his hand up. Should I wait for the mic? Or? No. No problem. Um, thank you very much for your presentations, and also for the body of your work, which for many of us has just thrilled us over time. Um, I have a question. You both talked about crossing the human animal divide. But what about, uh, and I, I, I'm asking you this in terms of the Christian tradition, you've both written on that. What about crossing the divinity and analogy divide. Um, Lori, you talked about the Duomo in, in, uh, in Oviedo, the dropping of the pigeons, the, and, and how in Christianity, God is figured, God is the spirit, is figured as a, as a dove. Is it possible that in Christianity, God is an animal? God is a human being, but perhaps also could God be figured responsibly in Christianity? as a non-human animal. And if that's the case, would that engender in Christians and other people of goodwill a sense of fellow feeling and divine experience of the more than human world? 
You know, I think in a lot of ways that has happened in the history of the Christian tradition, right? Um, but that, um, that particular feast day in Orvieto, the, the dove doesn't live through this usually, right? Um, and so that's really interesting, right? The Holy Spirit um, embodied in a dove who we're now killing, um, which is, so sometimes I am hopeful about that. I mean, there are many ways that animals have been seen as the embodiment of the divine, or at least recognizing the sacred. Um, when humans don't in many of the stories of the, in the Christian tradition. Um, but at least to this point, it seems not to have impacted any of the practices that humans continue to undertake. And so um, we could keep on down that road, but I'm not sure if that work will necessarily get us to where we need to go. I think I used to think it did more than I do now. Um, but um, I, I, it's certainly one step. I, I think it's something that's worth continuing to dig out of the tradition and point out, yeah. A, a quick reply, Mark, thank you for the great blue heron reference. That was really a nice visitation, if I can say it that way. Um, you know, anciently, of course, and in small scale society still, uh, animals can be thought, uh, non-human animals can be thought of as divinities or messengers of the divinity. There's this connection all, uh, around. Um, I'm gonna dodge the question slightly about major uh, traditions that most of us are familiar with by saying, I don't think you can understand contemporary religion without understanding the non-human animal piece there. It's not because the high theologies, as it were, the institutional accounts can't be understood. They're human exceptionalists often. But that if you go on the ground in communities, even if the theology officially is they don't matter, they're here for us, the actual realities are engaging um, in a rich, rich way. To me, that so sometimes we write about scholars' religion and we reify it into something that's human exceptionalist, but the actual on the ground realities are much, much richer, and I think your question can get fielded at, at the on the ground level. Let's take three questions in, in rapid fire succession here. Um, I, I saw a hand in the front, uh, I, I see Cynthia in the back, and uh, Norm, Norman in the, in the back row as well. So three quick questions, then we'll let our panelists respond. Thank you very much. As a virtue ethicist, I have been challenged with a tradition that says to be virtuous is to be better than animal. And uh, I've also come to uh, believe that it is impossible for us human beings to cultivate virtues, including ecological virtues, without a little bit of help from our friends, non-human animals, plants, mushrooms. Impossible. We're talking about capacities. Um, I think that is because all of our virtue traditions have descended from shamanic practices. Oh, however, now I am challenged with how to bring this very uh, unpolitically uh, <coughs> correct piece of information, <laughs> uh, help people cultivate virtues with a little bit of help from our friends. Do we have practical solutions? Do we have suggestions, ways to turn? Okay. And let's hear Cynthia's question. It's not a, oh, excuse me. In response to Mark's comment, I, uh, I, I once gave a talk. Uh, asked, I was asked to do a talk in, on ecofeminism, and I entitled it, this was at Seattle University, I entitled it, Adam was not a guy and Jesus was a mammal. Right. And um, <laughs> really portraying Jesus as a mammal was very, very, it had, it was very impactful on, on students listening to, to think in those, in that terminology. So I wanted to affirm your question and, and just to note that it is, uh, Christianity has this amazing resource of claiming incarnation in mammal form. Yep. And then Norman, and then we'll let our panelists respond. First, thanks so much to both of you. I, what you've done in your work has just been phenomenal. But here's a question about the structural transformation of practical life, right? For many people today, most people, I would say, animals are something to look at. And so this is unparalleled in human history where animals have been creatures, fellow creatures, to live with. And I'm wondering if in animal studies, this, this side of it is being broached about the very built environments that many of us occupy as the primary impediment to seeing, not, not seeing is the wrong word, living with animals because it's our seeing that has then resulted in 
you know, these highly stylized programs like wing migration, which are beautiful to look at, or the commodification of all animal forms and plant forms, right? That it's this removal of ourselves from our lives with others that is at root something to be investigated. On virtue ethics. Virtue ethics gets a resurgence in modern times, being started with Aristotle and others, of course, because utilitarianism and deontology as prevailing uh, modes of analyzing our ethical abilities were act-oriented, and virtue ethics looks at the whole life. Whole life is lived in a real ecological context, which is chock full of all kinds of other living beings. Hmm. Norman's, the cities we live in now have tons of non-human animals. There's wonderful work on urban animals out coming out that's fantastic. City Creatures, a, a book mm -hmm. about Chicago's uh, urban animals. So it seems to me virtue ethics speaks powerfully to the kinds of holistic concerns that religion and ecology are looking at that we're looking at. Um, and there is, of course, a, a set of virtues that are so human-focused that, whoa, how do we possibly do this? But there are many virtues, paragons of virtues, outside our own species. Wolves are often described as that. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Cynthia, thank you. Yeah, the, I think one of the things that um, Christianity do, does have to get over is the whole idea that this incarnation wasn't a single male human being, right? And, that, and so Jesus as a mammal, I think, is a great way to start that, too. So that's a, that's a, a good idea. Um, a wonderful piece on looking at animals. I don't know if you're familiar with, the, with John Berger, art historian, why look at animals, sort of a, a grounding piece in cultural studies of animals and critical animal studies. Um, and I think you're right, I'm reading a piece that I just got, it's um, an unpublished piece that, that someone shared with me on really looking at the 17th century transition to animal as com other animals and human bodies had been commodities already, but, but both as commodity and how that really essentially changes our relationship um, with other animals. Um, and so I think that is what a three or four century now development that is going to be, because it has become, as Paul pointed out, that 90% figure of animals who live on this planet, humans and others, are all sort of under human control now, um, what we do with that. Um, that why, that's why it, it is scary to flip it, right? Can we flip it? And if we do, what does that mean? Yeah. But, on Berger, John Berger is a literary critic, so he has this powerful uh, conceptuality that might appeal to many academics. He mm -hmm. made an observation that zoos are a monument to the impossibility of the encounter they attempt to create. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> It's a lovely intellectual phrasing yeah. of that. Yeah. Uh, but it is a, if you go to zoos, watch. See what kind of education is going on in zoos. What child leaves a zoo without recognizing who's behind bars and who's not? Okay. They learn the division there. Magnificent elephants, rhinoceroses, etc. And who's walking out of the zoo? Who gets to walk back in? They're there for whose education? And what kind of education? So zoos... Um, there's a wonderful set, you, have, you asked many of those, <laughs> but the practical side of this is terribly important as well. It's no simple task. Well, but we can go back to religion and ecology because religion and ecology, as many have pointed out, no simple task to broker what the environmental humanities people are after or Mary Evan and John have pushed, pushed, pushed relentlessly for, but still isn't recognized in so many circles. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take a few more questions over here and then... Um, well, David in the center, and then we'll come back to someone on this end of the room after that. Just I've been hearing more and more of the non-human, and I'm wondering whether that doesn't actually still keep us trapped. Yeah. Uh, the mm. human and the non-human. Yeah. It yeah. sure does. Yeah. Anthropomorphism is a complex concept with a long history. Um, it wasn't that long ago that it was demonized as a sin in the study of uh, other than human animal behavior. And I just wonder if you would speak to the usefulness of, of anthropomorphism uh, or the non-usefulness of that in thinking about um, new relationship with, between um, humans and other species. Do you want Oh, okay, we'll take a few, yeah. Uh, yes, and Laurel in the back as well. <laughs> sorry. Wait, sorry. Yeah, right here. Right. Sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, so uh, this uh, comment um, pertains to the whole question of um, the dualism or crossing the divide between the, the divi divine and animals. And 
you you referenced uh, uh, Chimanada's um, statement about the dangers of a single story, and rem that reminded me of um, Chinuachebe's book, mm -hmm. Things Fall Apart. What's the name of it? Things fall apart. Things fall apart. Okay. Yeah. The trouble um, in Nigeria, things fell apart when um, uh, the Christians insisted that uh, the snake be killed. And um, for the Igbo people, Shimanada is one of uh, an Igbo person, the snake is on the side of the di uh, divine world. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Christian mythology, and the snake is a bad guy, uh, the bad press, the, the demonization of the uh, of the snake. So, is there like a hierarchy um, uh, among animals that we, you know humans tend to favor some against others, and what would be um, uh, the implications of, of this whole question of animals? Um, their divinity or their humanity across across cultures, and um, you you did mention that in some uh, cases that divide is not as as huge. Uh, Sarah mentioned the the problem of elephants being treated cruelly in India, but I thought you know that's kind of paradoxical because in India we have Ganesha. The elephant god. So uh, uh, that divide is not as strong, but yet we still have money to harm yeah. um, animals. And let's just have Laurel's question and then Laura and Paul. Since my wonderful student told me to be brief, I will. <laughs> um, I'm on a sort of crusade to uh, remind the world that John Wesley said one of our early reformers, to not see God in the face of every creature is indeed a kind of practical atheism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to just sort of think about the impact of that statement. To chase God out of the world, only see God in human, is, is atheism. For Wesley. Well, a um, couple things. First, um, I wish Donna Haraway would come up with a word, because if anyone could, she could, mm -hmm. um, that would get us out of the human, non-human, animal, human, that whole, the language just doesn't work for it, so Bella agreed totally on that. Um, hugely thankful to Mark Beckoff for what he's done in terms of pulling anthropomorphism back into um, mythology. I mean, he's been brilliant in doing that. Um, when it was not allowed, he, he did it again, so, so I think we need to. Um, there are some studies that are being done now on, on dogs, you'd think I would know about that, um, where they're putting um, dogs who have been trained to like it, they're not sho shoving them in there, into MRIs and um, working to see how their brain patterns are functioning. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the tests they did was when they, they had um, four different things for these dogs to smell. One was a dog they knew, another is a dog they didn't know, a human they didn't know, and the human that they live with. And when the human that they live with, when that was the odor they were given, the love part of their brain lit up, right? So I think that anthropomorphism might be kind of okay, because I think a lot of our brains work a lot more similarly to each other than differently from each other. Um, and so I, don't, I, I think that the ethologists are bringing that back, back in a little bit in hopeful ways. Um, and quickly, with, with Laurel, thank you as well for the Divin Animality Conference several years ago, Drew. You had a lot to do with that, and that was a wonderful way of looking at human, human divine. So, On the anthropomorphism, there's a wonderful essay by Franz de Waal called Anthropo Denial, mm -hmm. saying, listen, what, what are we supposed yeah. to be using? What tools would we use? At, because we are mammals, after all, and there are shared features, and to use it critically is the real issue here. So there's much of a movement, but there's still many scientific domains in which they say it's a sin. It's an unusual theological concept in science, is it not? Um, <laughs> hierarchy, yes. De facto animal protection run around the world is run on uh, about 10,000 different species maybe, but there are, latest estimates are up um, uh, well over 10 million species, only 2 million identified. But when you get down to the micro level <laughs> beings, the most recent estimates, there might be a trillion species, a trillion species, holy smoke. Um, <laughs> The world is busy, shall we say, and is there a hierarchy? Yes, we're fairly small 
brain primates, and so we have a limited capacity. But getting it beyond the human is the certain, once we get it beyond the human, then we can explore how inadequately we've done that. Um, and what's wonderful on the ground is so many people here do get it in their daily lives across. I can look around the room and see literally dozens of people I know that do that, you think. And, and Mary Ellen, back to the compliment, such a powerful thing that 20 years ago when we started the conference, this would not have been an acceptable conversation in the academic precincts, whereas now you see nodding heads. And back to the dynamics of the students that I have arrive at my program, my job sometimes is to get out of their way or walk alongside <laughs> them at the very least, at the best. And I sometimes tease that I should be paying tuition. They are so on their own lights pursuing it. It's what you want in graduate students. You probably see this in your yoga studies, Chris. You see, although I, I bet you they're not ahead of you. My students are sometimes ahead of me because of the diversity of animal protection issues. But it's a profoundly moving thing in education to see the dynamics. You see it in religion and ecology where people are leaning in rather than away from their academic um, interests. Yeah. We have a few more minutes, and yes, very eager hand right here in the front. Yeah, down. thank you both so much for, for this and, and for the fact that we are able to talk about other than human animals in, in the context of religion and ecology. Um, uh, and Laura, I really appreciated um, how you were reminding us what it means to act out our superiority towards animals and all the different ways that we suppress them. And then I was also struck by, I think you said something like, uh, they'd all be okay if we got out of the way or they'd all be okay without us. And um, I wanted to explore that a little bit more because uh, I don't know about, I don't know as much about the history of humans and animals, but I do know that in some forested areas, studies have shown that humans have um, contributed to the biodiversity of the flora by actually introducing, and not just in introduce non-native species, but in, in the Amazon, for example, of, of bringing species and sort of cultivating gardens that enrich the biodiversity and then maybe subsequently um, help the fauna too, I'm not sure. But so thinking about humans enriching biodiversity of flora <coughs> in that way, I just wondered how, like, whether it would be good if we totally got out of the way or, or whether that might reduce biodiversity and richness for fauna. And if you could reflect on that. Yeah, do you want to answer that quickly and then we'll take the last Yeah, I'll do that quickly. Um, I, I don't think I said not all would be okay. I think um, the, I, the ongoing life of the planet might be better off if, if we were out of the way. I'm not a complete misanthrope, but I'm something of one. Um, and so I think that there's certainly a lot of other animals who would very, uh, dogs probably wouldn't survive or would change significantly. They're only around because of us and we because of them. Um, and so I think that there are some animals that, that might not fare so well if we were out of the way, but of the trillion, I think probably the majority of those trillion would do better with us out of the way right now, unless we significantly change the ways we're living. I think we could significantly change the ways we're living and then that wouldn't be the case, but, but the road we're marching down now, yeah. Totally agree, yeah. but I was just wondering, like, can, can, we imagine, sorry, yeah. can we imagine a different path? Obviously it's not with seven billion people for sure. one, but. I mean, I, and I think that's a lot of what almost everyone in this room is hoping and yeah. trying to do and has been, yeah, yeah. We are still of use. We, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so too. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless of the title of his paper. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, let's make this our final question because I'm getting the uh, time limit sign here. Thank you. Um, I have the luxury of, of living in Iowa and spending pretty large portions of time on my piece of land. I'm cautious to say my, but anyway. Uh, sort of getting over Descartes and <laughs> figuring out how I can still justify four years of reading Kierkegaard. So, so this has been mulling for for about two years, and, and I'm grateful to be back in the fold of, of this conference from 25 years ago. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a question comment about language. Um, I think we are trapped in our thoughts by virtue of, of the language and the words that we have to use to express things. So acknowledging that I think the larger comment, and, and to your point about 20 years ago, this would have been 
ooh, kind of a conversation. But it's, but it's, but not just about animals. It's on spectrums on everything. I think what we're doing, and I remember a speech I gave about 25 years ago, first saying, sustainability will be a placeholder word. We're kind of at the point that we were at the Renaissance, when almost nobody was trying to say, well, we're at the beginning of this vastly new era, but you were doing the work of being in it. And I think we're perhaps at that kind of really big shift in the world, and we should bring a tremendous amount of humility to it, um, that we realize we've functioned in such a binary kind. You are either male or female. You are either, you know, gay or straight. I mean, all of these things. And what we're realizing is that we actually have so much more capacity if we look at life as spectrums. And we've had such a vertical hierarchy uh, just built into all of our institutional structures. And I've often said, thanks to my grandfather, we should turn them on, turn them this way instead of vertically and realize that at different points on virtually each subject or division and I hesitate to use division, we're at different places on the spectrum. And I think if we open up to, thank you, because <laughs> uh, I wouldn't even be doing it for you, but if we opened it up to that, we then allow much more, and as you say, to, to, to our students and children and those physically younger <coughs> than us, you know, they aren't burdened with some of that, but we are all transitioners in yeah. this, this part. And I hope we'll spend some time working on language that allows us to let these thoughts and, and the realizations come into a solidity that they don't have right now. Thank you. Kevin, I'd say one thing at the risk of offending everyone in the room, um, <laughs> that watching language function this last week or so has been very interesting. Um, from, and here we go, from pussy grabbing to who's allowed to use that word and to watch, to listen to some feminists who have been using it in poetry to reclaim it. Okay. Um, and then to watch animal shelters um, who advertised, hey, we've got plenty of them, come in and grab some of our pussies, they need a new home. Um, <laughs> so to watch that language, we actually are brilliant with language, right? Um, there are other voices too, but language can be used in so many empowering and disempowering and creative ways that it's, um, most of the municipalities made their animal shelter directors who are almost all female take those advertisements down off Facebook fairly quickly. But they got some cats adopted. So. Final word? Yeah, just one. Let the Zen Buddhists here have a, a final word. They have this wonderful saying, a person who has 100 miles to travel does well to count 90 miles as the halfway point, and we are a few steps into this long journey. And it is an important journey, and we will not be perfectionist early on, maybe not later. But the point is to be very, very, uh, John, Mary Eva, I'm going to go back to you again. You, it is so hospitable to be in this group. It is a truly communal experience. It's very nested in this way. You can have many different interests. It's a very powerful notion that models for us well how we can live in the broader world. Thank you. Yes. Truly. Thank you. Thank you.